vitamin D, the bird's eye view. So I am not allowed to dive deep into the subject unless and until the bird is kingfisher. So I'll do just the superficial job, but still I'll try to make the topic a bit interesting because these are questions. There are many questions which are, which are around vitamin D which are asked by patients to us. And because this is back to basics, so I'll be running very swiftly because most of this information is well known to you. So vitamin D, we know that it's a fat-soluble vitamin and it is both a nutrient and a hormone. The basic function is to help the body to absorb and retain calcium and phosphorus. And then it is also associated with a great variety of diseases like asthma, cancer, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, and strikingly to mortality, which I'll discuss. There is a widespread presence of the vitamin D receptors, and that's why it is acting at multiple places in the body, which once again I'll superficially talk about. Now if we talk about the generation of vitamin D, which happens with the exposure of sunlight onto the skin, the dehydrocholesterol converts into the cholecalciferol, and then the dietary supplementation also, if it is coming, then everything is stored in liver. There it is hydroxylated to 25 hydroxycholecalciferol and then further hydroxylation takes place in kidney, that is 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol, which is the active vitamin D known as calcitriol. The, uh, the, the, here, the important thing is that the season, the latitude, the time of the day, and the duration of the exposure all matters once it is the exposure of the sunlight. Coming to the diet, because we know that it is found scarcely in uh, a few food elements like fish, liver oils, or fatty fish, mushrooms, egg yolks, and liver. There are two vitamin forms which are available, that is vitamin D2, that is algocholecalciferol, uh, and D3, that is the cholecalciferol. Now, interesting fact here is that sun rays, they are capable enough of giving us adequate amount of vitamin D, but if suppose we want to get that amount of vitamin D through food sources, then we will have to basically ingest nearly 100 eggs or almost 170 cubes of the cheese every day to get to the recommended amount of vitamin D. So this is why we have a lot of vitamin D deficiency because we have sun avoiding behavior and probably we will not be able to consume that much amount of vitamin D through diet. Now is there a difference between the vitamin D3 and D2 supplements if we uh, get it from market, we have these two forms available. But basically the plant source derived, generated or synthesized vitamin is D2 and the animal soul generated is D3. And if we talk of the debate on D3 and D2, now it is clear that the D3 supplements, they tend to raise the blood concentrations much more than D2. And here is the effect. The D3 is capable of giving that incremental uh, increase in 25 hydroxycholecalciferol as compared to the D2. And this is why we see that most of the formulations which are available to us in market are D3. Coming to the differential effect of uh, 125 hydroxycholecalciferol and 25, there are a bit of differences here also. The 125 hydroxycholecalciferol, it basically affects the calcium muscle bone health and it is also responsible for regulation of blood pressure and insulin production. If we talk of the 25 hydroxycholecalciferol, it has got some better response as far as the regulation of cell growth is concerned, the cancer prevention is concerned, or regulation of the immune functions, diabetes type 1, multiple sclerosis, and other autoimmune conditions are concerned. So there's a bit of difference as far as the action is concerned. Now coming to the major targets of vitamin D, if we talk of kidney, there it helps in absorption of calcium and phosphorus. If we talk of the skin, we know that it leads to generation of vitamin D3, if we talk of parathyroid there, it is acting as a negative feedback mechanism, suppresses parathyroid hormone. Talking of uh, pancreatic beta cells, Dr. B.M. Akkar has given quite a significant talk on this, that it leads to increased insulin secretion and synthesis. We talk of bone, it is responsible for bone health. But importantly now, because we know that a lot of immune functions, they are being rooted through vitamin D. And there it is in lead to in monocyte differentiation to macrophages or maybe the antigen presenting capacity of the macrophages that is affected, that is decreased, and there are many other immune related functions and that's why vitamin D is linked to many autoimmune disorders. Coming to vitamin D 
absorption. Once ingested, there is a passive transfer into the intestinal cells. This is through the brush borders, but further on it needs energy and calcium sodium exchanger or maybe the pumping out of the cal binding protein. And this is why the common question asked if suppose we are continuing to con consume vitamin D, uh, this calcium in our supply as a supplementation, will we be leading to hypercalcemia? The answer is here that probably in most of the cases that is not going to happen. Now, if we talk of the action of 125 cholecalciferol on kidney, we know that it helps increasing in the calcium resorption. If we talk of action on the bone, it is the osteoblastic activity which goes up. So there is a remodeling, which is a continuous process in the bone. The osteoclastic differentiation, differentiation it happens, and it stimulates the osteoblast alkaline secretion. If we talk of the negative feedback mechanism, if there is adequacy of vitamin D, then there is an inhibition of parathyroid hormone and the bones are kept intact. But if there is a deficiency of vitamin D and deficiency of calcium, then the body has priority to maintain the homeostasis of calcium. And though this negative feedback mechanism now is converted into a positive feedback mechanism, and there is more of parathyroid hormone secretion, which will lead to bone resorption, and we are aware about the secondary bone disease. Once there is, uh, this is happening, once the kidney is involved, the conversion of the uh, uh, decalcitriol is hampered, and then this negative feedback mechanism onto the parathyroid hormone, more of the parathyroid hormone secretion, and that will lead to the bone of, uh, more of the bone resorption leading to secondary bone disease. If we talk of the vitamin D receptors, they are present in many of the tissues in the body, but the action here is that upon arrival onto the target cell, the 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol dissociates from the vitamin D binding protein, enters into the cell nucleus, and there it will interact with the vitamin D receptors. And this is happening at multiple places, and this is what was discussed yesterday by Dr. B.M. Makar. Coming on to the recommended daily allowances for the vitamin D, these are the ICMR 2020 guidelines that accepting for infants where the recommendation is 400 international unit, rest everywhere, it is 600 recommended units. Somewhere, it is also mentioned that adults more than 70 years of age, they require 800 international units. But then we know that most of the times we give 2,000 international units in Indian subjects, and this is something which is once again debated, and probably that is something which has to be revised. And that's why that recommendation of 2,000 international units per day is there. Now coming to the classification, where do we say that it is deficiency, insufficiency, sufficiency of toxicity? The level of deficiency is less than 20 nanograms per ml. Where from it comes? It comes basically from the fact that be below that level of 20 nanograms per ml, this will lead to elevation of parathyroid hormone and a decrease in the intestinal calcium resorption. And therefore this 20 nanogram figure is labeled as a deficiency level. And beyond that, it is insufficient 21 to 29, sufficiency more than 30, and I'll come back to this figure once again, what is the optimal? And then toxicity is more than 150 nanograms per ml. As far as the magnitude is concerned, this is the most undiagnosed and undertreated nutritional deficiency in the world. Of course, various studies, they use different cutoffs, and therefore the values are different. But we know that the reason behind is the pigmented skin, what we have, skin covering clothes and sun avoiding behavior, that is responsible for vitamin D deficiency in most of us. If we talk of the figures, then this is the community-based studies, multiple studies, they have given us that figure of 50 to 94 percent prevalence of vitamin deficiency in a country like India where we have ample amount of sunlight. Coming to the hospital-based studies, once again, this figure is between 37 to 99 percent. I have already said the cutoffs are different. But then, once again, it is a mind-boggling figure of nearly 100 percent in patients, those who are having vitamin D deficiency. So coming to the fact that vitamin D deficiency in whom? So vitamin D deficiency may occur from a lack, of, lack in the diet or a prolonged breastfeeding because we know that vitamin D concentrations are very low in human milk. There is poor absorption or having a metabolic need for higher amounts, does not have or receive enough ultraviolet sun exposure, people who cannot tolerate or do not eat milk or other products which are having some amount of vitamin D in them, 
People with inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, or other conditions that disrupt the normal digestion of fat. People who are obese and tend to have, they have lesser amount of vitamin D levels because vitamin D accumulates in the excess fat tissues, but it is not available. Conversely, if these patients, if suppose they lose weight suddenly, then there is more of vitamin D which is released, and this is something which is also seen, observed in the population. Patients, those who have undergone gastric bypass, because there, there is a removal of a small, uh, the upper part of the small intestine where the vitamin D is absorbed. In other conditions where the catabolism is increased, like the use of certain anti-convulsants, glucocorticoids, or there is a decrease in synthesis of vitamin D, like in liver failure, in case of urinary loss, like nephrotic syndrome, or decreased synthesis, like in chronic kidney disease. So all these conditions, if suppose they are there, then it can lead to vitamin D deficiency. Another interesting fact, that is suppose you are exposed to sun rays, but you are in a glassed sort of uh, environment, maybe sitting in a glassed office or maybe in your car, probably this is not going to help, and this is something misnomer. Coming to the associated diseases, if suppose we talk of bones, then we are all aware that it can lead to rickets, osteomalacia, osteoporosis. If we talk of muscles, then it can lead to muscle pain, then the proximal muscle weakness. If we talk of association of conditions, then it is diabetes where it is associated, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, various sorts of infections where it can even affect the outcomes. If we talk of autoimmune disorders, then it is linked with various autoimmune dis disorders. If we talk of skin diseases or if we talk of cancers, there also it is, it is associated. Parkinson's disease, where vitamin D deficiency was seen in patients with Parkinson's disease, even suicide, the lower vitamin D levels were associated with an increase in the risk of suicide. Autoimmune diseases like vitamin D is a potent modulator of immune system and is involved in regulation of this cell proliferation and differentiation. So lot many places where vitamin D is really linked. When I was going, while preparing this, uh, I came across these striking headlines and uh, these are very recent headlines in Times of India and uh, the medical news today and Medscape that low vitamin D is linked to increased mortality. So I was forced to go into the literature further, do we have more evidence to it? And this is another study which is published in Annals of Internal Medicine 2022, October, just a couple of months back. And it's a very long study. It's a follow-up, 14 years, nearly 3 lakh individuals were followed on and it has given that all-cause mortality has an L-shaped sort of uh, risk death. So there is, suppose the levels are somewhere around less than 50 nanomole per liter, so the more you have less below this, the more is the mortality. And therefore, this figure of 20 nanomole per liter of vitamin D is probably the optimal level which we should target. So there is a causal relationship between vitamin D deficiency and mortality, and this is something which was new to me and very striking as such. Coming on to COVID and vitamin D, because we have been giving COVID, uh, we are giving vitamin D to COVID patients, and here is one study. This is the uh, SHADE study. Briefly going on to this, it has uh, given us that summary that great proportion of vitamin D deficient individuals with this COVID infection, they turned COVID negative with the significant decrease in the fibrogen on high dose of cholecalciferol supplementation. Going on to another study, which is the meta-analysis of 13 studies, 10 observational and 3 RCTs, once again gave insight that vitamin D supplementations might be associated with improved clinical outcomes, especially when administered after the diagnosis of COVID-19. Coming on to vitamin D and diabetes, this was nicely taken up by uh, Dr. B.M. Makari yesterday, but briefly, this uh, talking about a very big trial involving 83,000 uh, women diabetes at baseline and followed in the nurses' health study for development of diabetes. And here, nurses, those who are on vitamin D supplementation, they had 13% lower risk of developing diabetes. And if they were taking calcium along with vitamin D, then there was 33% lesser chance of developing diabetes. So this gives that insight that if suppose there is a person who is consuming vitamin D along with calcium, probably will be protected from getting diabetes. In addition to the vitamin D uh, in diabetes, it influences the renin angiotensin system, inflammation and mineral bowel disease, which may be associated with the cause and progression of uh, 
the kidney disease in diabetic subjects. Another interesting fact that we do a BMD in our patients to know the bone health, but in diabetic subjects, it is found that doing BMD and getting a normal BMD still will not decrease the chances of getting fractures and fall. And this is because of the bone quality, which we are not able to assess with the just BMD. So another interesting fact that there is some improvement in the structure of the bone, which happens once we are supplementing vitamin D. So if we talk of cancer here, I'll just run short on this because we know that there are a lot of cancers wherein vitamin D is associated with. Colorectal cancer is something which is greatly associated, but there are trials wherein they did not show significant difference between the vitamin D and the placebo, but the median years of study was five years, and the study itself mentions that we have to continue this study for at least 15 years to know what really happens in terms of getting more cancers here. But the important part here is in cancer patients, there is 13% lower risk of cancer mortality in those assigned to vitamin D. And vitamin D may have a stronger effect on the cancer progression than for the incidence. <coughs> Coming on to the mechanisms, the mechanisms, I'll just cut short, I'll go to the cardiovascular disease. Here, once again, the Framingham offspring, uh, offspring study participants who were free of cardiovascular disease at the baseline, nearly 1,700 patients. And here it was seen that in this, pro uh, uh, there was uh, a significant decline or decrease in the mortality, the cardiovascular mortality in patients, those who are having uh, um, uh, good vitamin D levels as against patients, those who are having less vitamin D. So there is a dose response association between the circulating vitamin D and the risk of cardiovascular disease, and there are various studies to it. Coming on to another point, which might have come to everyone's mind by now, that we should be continuing with supplementation. But here, the taking vitamin D supplementation has not been found to reduce cardiovascular risk, though there are various studies, significant ones, they say that once the patient is having lesser vitamin D concentration, they will have more of mortality. But once we are giving supplementation, we are not getting that sort of response. So here there is a dilemma, and we need more of research here. But if we want to go in for the vitamin D and hypertension, then certainly vitamin D supplementation is capable of decreasing the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure significantly to the tune of nearly 3 to 6 millimeter mercury decline. If we talk of the immune functions, then multiple sclerosis incidence is something, if suppose we give a good amount of vitamin D, then the, the incidence of getting multiple sclerosis goes down significantly in the, in the population and there are prospective studies to it. Coming to another question which will come to anyone's mind, could vitamin D supplementation help boost our body's defenses to fight infectious diseases such as tuberculosis and seasonal flu? And here, if we talk of the autoimmune disorders or, disorders or these common uh, ailments, then certainly daily or weekly vitamin D supplementations lowers the risk of acute respiratory infections. The effect was particularly prominent with very deficient individuals. Tuberculosis, though we find vitamin D levels less in tubercular patients, but then the relationship, once again, here is not very clear. It is as far as the cause is concerned, as far as the effect of the improvement is concerned. But if we talk of other autoimmune disorders, then it, it is found to reduce the incidence of autoimmune diseases by about 22%. And here if we talk of rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, autoimmune thyroid disease, etc. So vitamin D and metabolic syndrome, another important area because it is found to be implicated in hypertension, hyper uh, lipidemia, hyperglycemia, and obviously it is going to affect the metabolic syndrome. Vitamin D and obesity, once again, because vitamin D is affecting the adipogenesis, and therefore here it plays a role in development of obesity. De depression, once again, it's associated patients, those who are having vitamin D, they have more chances of getting depression. And in the last, this is my last slide, we cannot talk of vitamin D without talking about uh, vitamin D toxicity. So vitamin D toxicity is most commonly happening once we are supplementing vitamin D. Low amounts of vitamin D found in food elements and whatsoever amount you consume, you are not going to get to those toxic levels. And if we talk of the excessive exposure to sun, once again, it is not going to give toxicity because 
the skin prevent the temperature in the skin will prevent Sometimes the vitamin D from forming. What are the signs of uh, the toxicity? Anorexia, nausea, poor appetite and weight loss, constipation, irregular heartbeat, hardening of blood vessels and tissues due to increased blood vessels in the calcium, urinary lithiasis, metastatic calcification and alveoli, muscles, gastric mucosa. And therefore, in summary, vitamin D deficiency is certainly very common to the tune of more than 90%. And apart from dietary intake, basically we'll have to focus on to some exposure. And if that is not happening, then supplementation is the answer. Certainly, oral supplementation should be the choice, not the injectable ones, because they are something which can lead to toxicity. Thank you so much for